Thank you. Uh, I haven't settled on that title, so that's maybe a good sign that I should be thinking. Um, I'm going to keep this really short because there's, there's, there's loads and loads um, scheduled to be quite a short amount of time today. Um, I just wanted to re reiterate the, the questions that Mark had put forward as kind of framing uh, well, the rest of the week as a whole, but, but I, I think that they're really particularly relevant to the speakers that we've got today. Um, the first one was, was who and what determines how cultural resources are distributed and for what purposes. Um, you know, I think you, 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 some, some very simple kind of exercises, but interesting and instructive exercises can be done by just looking at kind of what, what correlations can we see between the kinds of places that have been shut down or the kinds of institutions, the kinds of projects that have been shut down uh, in recent years. Um, what, what kind of things do these particular projects share? Uh, and then the inverse, you know, what, not only what, what places are remaining open, but what places are kind of flourishing at the moment. And from those two sort of acts of observation, I think we can, we can kind of discern quite a lot about what it is that culture and art is sort of intended to do in the current political uh, and economic environment. Um, I was reading, Neil's going to be talking in a minute, I was reading one of Neil's papers about Spears Lock in the north of Glasgow uh, over the weekend, and this seemed like a really interesting example of, of actually, you know, we talk about the idea of the instrumentalisation of culture as being something of, of art as being something that kind of emerged in the 1990s, but it's you know it's still very much around. And I think we need to think about what it is that we as cultural producers are being kind of compelled to to do. What roles we're being compelled to perform. The next question: um, What are the effects of privatisation on the arts? I, did, I found this quite an intriguing question because I think privatisation is such a sort of I don't know, simultaneously very specific but also a very open word. So. So obviously there's the question of kind of private sponsorship, private funding of the arts. But then uh, it, it also made me think, I was reading something a while ago about, uh, by Andrew McCrobby about the idea of the, kind of the privatisation of risk. And the idea that in order to, to kind of um, to, to succeed, to, to exist within kind of cultural spheres, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a necessity to stake your own kind of resources you know, into, into your, you know, put them forward, um, to, to, to put those things at risk uh, in order to kind of take part within in the, the cultural sector. And of course the issue is there that it, it, it means that there's a, a very much kind of narrowing of who is able to do that, which then, you know, inflects kind of who produces culture, what kinds of cultures are produced. So I think that's another, you know, this, this question of privatisation, I think we can think about that quite broadly. Um, Next one, very, very, you know, modest question here. Uh, how can we actively transport, transform art, work, and culture for the better? Uh, I don't want to say anything in response to that because that, that would seem very presumptuous to, to try and answer that. But yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I will leave that. One. And then the, the, the final question, another big one. Um, how can we build radically new forms of collective cross-cultural organisation? And I think. It's probably uh, something that should kind of be added on to the, the, the previous other big question, which is how can we do this whilst being aware of the kind of the structures and institutional forms that we are complicit within, that we are part of? Um, how can we be critical towards those, but how can we also not become kind of immobilised and crippled by a sort of permanent uh, awareness of how much we are implicated within the structures that we're trying to kind of dismantle. How can that you know, be something that is, uh, uh, how can that be a mindset that is productive rather than something that just freezes us into not doing anything, uh, lest what we do somehow ends up being kind of turned against us, which obviously is very much the case uh, in terms of kind of radical forms of cultural production for a very long time. Um, so, Today, we're going to have two speakers, uh, first of all, followed by a break, and then three more speakers. And then it says break followed by roundtable, but I know how these things work. And if we have a break followed by an hour on roundtable at the end, everyone's going to disappear at 6 o'clock to go to the pub. So, I'm going to propose that, that we just kind of follow on from the final speakers and we just have a kind of shorter discussion um, at quarter to six. So, that's going to be the structure for the day. This morning, um, we've got two
two speakers. First of all, Neil Gray. Uh, Neil Gray is from the Urban Studies Foundation at the University of Glasgow. And some teaching around art and rent uh, and some other key words that I've forgotten about. <laughs> and what was the other one? Urbanism. Urbanism. Um, and then is Sarah here? Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, I'm Harry. How are you doing? Um, and then Sarah is here from Civic Room. Um, so she will be following that. And then there's a break at three o'clock. So I will now hand over to Neil, who's going to look after us first. Okay. So uh, thanks for inviting me, first of all, Market Gallery. I don't, I don't really know uh, a lot of people here, so it's always kind of strange in some ways when you speak to an audience you don't know because you never quite know where people are coming from. Uh, a good kind of approach for me is to say that generally I come from a very, very critical position. And I generally like to work in... in I guess I like to work in quite a general way. I like to understand how general processes operate. Uh, so there's a risk in doing that, that there might be some kind of abstraction and some generality, uh, but you know, I'm very willing and open to kind of discussing the particularity of things. So I'll make sort of quite bold claims in a way, and I'm sure some people might want to quibble with that, but I'd be quite happy to quibble, is what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to start, I might, we're going to see how it goes for time. I could assemble this paper together pretty quickly, so I don't have an exact time frame for it. I'm hoping it's going to be about 30 minutes, and then we can show a film that I made in West Bromwich, which relates very much to the themes I'll be discussing here, uh, which is about 10 minutes long. And I seem to have a particularly big slot because I've actually got the shoot off to London almost as soon as I finish this talk, so I can't really take part in the general discussion later on. Okay, so uh, the talk is entitled Between Art, Rent and Urbanism, and I'm going to start with a kind of favourite short poem of mine by Tom Leonard. Somewhere between stocks and shares and the commonsensical editorial, pity the poor arts page thinking itself alone. Uh, some situations theoretical and contemporary. So for me, this poem helps intimate how art can never be separated from wider socio-economic and representational issues, and the folly of thinking it can. My invitation to this event was primarily based on being able to provide historical contemporary context for how culture, broadly speaking, has been instrumentally bound up historically with a wider set of historic uh, socio-economic relations in Glasgow and elsewhere. I've always taken the avant-garde critique of roles and specialised division of labour very seriously. What I'll try to do here is bring the specific concerns of artists and cultural workers into dialogue with a wider set of relations, especially urbanism and the service industry, with the aim of providing some useful general context for the rest of the symposium. I'm going to use the questions raised on the programme as a convenient ready-made framework. So, firstly, who and what determines how cultural resources are distributed and for what purposes? Secondly, what are the effects of privatisation on the arts? Thirdly, how can we actively transform art, work and culture for the better? And I'll collapse that with the fourth question. How can we build radically new forms of collective cross-cultural organisation? As Harry said, that's a kind of quite preposterous set of questions to deal with. <laughs> But I'm going to maybe just try and intimate, open up some areas that we can discuss. So the first, who and what determines how cultural resources are distributed and for what purposes? Um, I mean, I've done quite a lot of work in, in and around art, gallery, uh, cultural context, but mainly I work around urban theory. So I'm going to kind of try to give you a general overview of what's been happening in Glasgow really since the, the 1970s, but especially through the 80s and 1990s. So, um, okay, so Glasgow's highly uneven neoliberal trans urban transformation, uh, beginning in earnest in the 1980s, can be traced back to the Glasgow East Area Renewal Project, which will be relevant for people from here. Uh, and that project was run between 1976 and 1987. Uh, and was concentrated in the 
this area, if deindustrialized East End, kind of really kind of running a lot, running parallel from the High Street, uh, the River Clyde, and Duke Street, in between, probably going out as far like beyond Parkhead. So approximately eight percent of the whole city of this project, and then in a way it was more or less the same area as the Clyde Gateway Regeneration Scheme, which was closely bound up with the Commonwealth Games. So it's like a massive, massive, massive scheme. Um, by then, the failures of Glasgow's post-war middling modernism, as it's been called, had become pretty obvious. The M8 crashing through the city centre, destroying tenements in its wake. The failure of a comprehensive development area, CDAs and new town policies which destroyed the old tenement communities and the urban fabric, while sim simultaneously generating massive population loss, jerry-built high-rise housing that in many cases had become riddled with damp and deeply unpopular by the mid-1970s. Suffering from an extreme fiscal crisis and something near a state of urban emergency, the Labour-led District Council, long resistant to outside inter interference, sought assistance from the Scottish office and gear was the result. Why is this important for this discussion? Gear marked a crucial and deeply influential point in the recalibration of the public sector as a facilitator of private investment. It marked out Glasgow District Council as an exemplar of proto-neoliberalism in the UK and indeed Europe, preceding renowned inner city regeneration projects such as London and Merseyside Docklands by six years. Generally, Gear was seen to have failed in its objective to create jobs, attract investment and improve the image of the area. Though it definitely did well in terms of rehabilitate in a lot of the tenement stock here. It kind of came around at roughly the same time that you had a lot of uh, local um, housing associations and cooperative housing movement was developing at that time and there was a lot of subsidies for rehabilitating housing. After a brief period of conservative rule actually kind of joint Conservative rule with the Labour Party from 1977 to 1980, and there's not many people <laughs> ever think about that period in Glasgow's history, actually. Uh, the Labour Party, chastened and reconstituted, began pursuing competitive city branding strategies. They took inspiration from gear, despite its extremely ambivalent results, and US models of neoliberal urban boosterism. Michael Kelly, who was then the Lord Provost, was heavily influenced by the I Love New York campaign in 1977, a campaign that masked and legitimised New York's emergence as the prototypical city of revanchist neoliberalism. Revanche comes from the French and literally means revenge. The geographer Neil Smith used the term to refer to ultra-authoritarian urban policies and policing in New York from the mid-1970s, with reference to the Bloody Week in 1870, when 20,000 Parisians were killed by royalists in a notorious act of brutal revenge following the Paris Commune. All this was, of course, willfully elided by the District Council, for it should be noted that Glasgow is still notorious today for its immense surveillance network. Glasgow's Smiles Better, uh, Miles Better campaign, or Smiles Better promotional campaign in 1983, was the result. The campaign is widely cited as one of the most successful city rebranding campaigns ever. It's effectively a Mr. Happy. <laughs> it doesn't seem to take much to please people sometimes. The campaign was followed by the National Garden Festival in 1988 and Glasgow's nomination as European Capital of Culture in 1990. The first time that an old industrial city had won the, won the award. What is notable, I think, for this symposium is that the District Council, innovatively in the terms of urban and cultural policy, explicitly co combined the culture year with urban redevelopment policy, gentrification, most notably in the merchant city and in the city centre. So this became a really influential model again for numerous other post-industrial cities in the UK and Europe, so that Glasgow can claim to have been at the vanguard of urban cultural regeneration policy in Europe, and I think that claim is pretty legitimate. We have to see such symbolic and cultural strategies as central to the city's symbolic transformation from Red Clydeside to neoliberal Paragon, and its material transformation from industry to services. In 1984, the Scottish Development Agency and the District Council commissioned an influential report by McKinsey & Co which recommended promoting a service sector economy in Glasgow. A year later, SDA launched Glasgow Action, the first clearly defined public-private partnership in urban Scotland. 
Glasgow Action took direct inspiration from US models of highly segregated and uneven neoliberal downtown development in Rust Belt cities such as Baltimore, Minneapolis, Detroit and Philadelphia. Two influential reports were later commissioned by the District Council. The Myerscoff Report of 1988, which stressed the economic importance of arts in Glasgow in creative industry terms, and the Comedia Report of 1991, which argued for the economic capture of Glasgow's cultural assets. Very notably, Charles Landry led the Comedia Report in the first formulation of a creative city thesis, which continues to circulate zombie-like as a mobile policy script and low-budget creativity fix for urban malaise despite a veritable mountain of evidence against it. The creativity fix is really one, only one type of mobile policy script, by which I mean the multiplying, ostensibly progressive, fast transfer policy fads in and between cities globally. The creativity fix refers to low budget, high visibility, urban policy panaceas for long-term socioeconomic neglect and decline. As Jamie Peck observes, notably following initial early millennial investigations, into the intercity and international import-export of workfare and welfare-to-work policies. The creativity fix represents a low-cost, market-friendly urban placido that is artfully scripted for today's political economic terrain. He says, the seductiveness of creat creativity strategies must be understood in terms of their basic complementarity with prevailing neoliberal development fixes their compatibility with discretionary, selective and symbolic supply-side supply policy making, by which he means tax breaks, gifted land, subsidies, etc. for business, and their conformity with the attendant array of development interests. Such fixes, perhaps especially in old industrial cities like Glasgow, have more effect on the language and image of urban politics than on the mitigation of social material inequalities. They invoke the promise of symbolic rebranding and regeneration, the rerouting of public budgets for high visibility urban interventions, and the reconciliation of conflicts between growth and quality of life, while disavowing entrenched power laden constituencies. Peck again. The discourses and practices of creative cities policy making are barely disruptive of the prevailing order of neoliberal urbanism. Based inter alia on polarizing labour and housing markets, property and market-led development, retrench public services and social programme, and accelerate an intercity competition for jobs, investment and assets. The Creative Cities thesis represents a soft policy fix for this neoliberal urban conjuncture, making the case for modest and discretionary public funding, uh, spending on creative assets, while raising a favoured bundle of middle-class lifestyles to the status of an urban development objective. Creativity fixes, and other fixes like sustainability fixes, which seem to be ubiquitous these days, are designed to convince us that two diametrically, diametrically opposed aims can proceed in harmony. The accommodation of ostensibly progressive concerns with and alongside growth-based urban entrepreneurialism. Richard Florida's creative classes idea, which asserts that place is a central organizing unit of the creative economy, providing the ecosystems that harness human creativity and turn it into economic value is one such creativity fix. For Florida, mobilizing venture capital is a prerequisite of establishing a strong creative city, creative class profile. There is nothing fuzzy at all about instrumentalizing creativity in this regard. As noted, despite a proliferating body of literature calling into question the premises and promises of a creative city, the creativity script has become standardised as a meta-policy in cities worldwide. But behind the hyperbole, Florida acknowledges a basic banality. The service economy, he admits, ultimately operates as the support infrastructure of the creative age. Members of the creative class, because they are well compensated and work long and unpredictable hours, require a growing pool of low-end service work workers to take care of them and do their course. Even stronger, there is a strong correlation between inequality and creativity. The more creative a region is, the more inequality you will find there. I can't really stress enough <laughs> that this is the, the major pre proponent of creative class thesis worldwide. It's amazing how those quotes are never really extracted from his work. Um, so, I mean, there is a danger in some of this kind of critique of flattening things out, as I've said. I'm, 
I'm trying to present a kind of very general picture. And, uh, but people like the post-autonomous uh, Maurizio Laterato, maybe a lot of people, some people might have read his stuff on debt lately, and others would rightly argue that the creative class is not so bounded in class terms as Peck suggests. And that is also often um, a class of low-end service workers. But this only confirms the dissembling, the dis dissembling nature of the creative city and creative classes thesis. And if Florida's self-reflexive exposition of these conditions is blasé, then the worker city group set up in 1988 to challenge the boosterism and aporias of a 1990 culture year and challenge for then recent branding of a uh, Trongay area now known as the Merchant City provide a more polemic corrective. I mean, just a quick note on that. I mean, the worker city are, are almost quite easy to caricature on the basis of the name alone, because it seems to sort of suggest some kind of authentic sort of Glaswegian working class culture which in a way the whole idea of the creative city was trying to move away from but actually if you look at the work what they were really examining the whole time was the, the looting of cultural infrastructures uh, the privatisation of land, the closure of culture and leisure services almost all of the worker city work had nothing at all to do with the manufacturing and industrial classes and even when they had evoked this uh, radical red Clydeside history, they actually did it in a really subtle and nuanced way that opened up all sorts of new social subjects from history and actually kind of broke down a lot of the stereotypes that existed around that. Um, sorry. So, so in terms of the aporius of a culture year, I have seen public, published claims. I was actually reading something and the Red Cockatoo by Mitch Miller and Johnny Roger about James Kelman, and they cited uh, somewhere that only 1% of the native population participated in the 1990 events. I've not been able to corroborate that, but it's a kind of pretty fascinating <laughs> statistic if it's true. Um, and what is clear is but I mean, I guess a, a, a clearer point is that funding culture in one area means cutting it from somewhere else. As Worker City member James Kelman wrote in 1992, over the coming years, the cost of this, actually this is published in 1992, but written before, over the coming years, the cost of this one PR exercise will have major repercussions for the ordinary cultural life of the city. He's talking about 1990, obviously. The money had to come from somewhere. Major cuts have already taken place in these areas precisely concerned with art and culture. The public funding of libraries, art galleries and museums, swimming baths, public parks and public halls, all are being cut drastically. Prime assets, not to mention services to the community, are being closed down and sold off altogether to private developers and to big business. What has been presented as a celebration of art in all its diversity is there to behold, a quite ruthless assault on the cultural life of the city. Clearly, uh, for anyone who has been paying attention, the same processes have been ongoing since 1990. The instrumental co-option of culture, the symbolic imagineering of the city, and the surface erasure of class and economic differentials that were central to the 1990 culture year have only intensified since that point. Community centres, daycare centres, libraries and swimming pools, etc., etc., have been shut down. Public land sales, recognised by groups like the Worker City as an obscene disposal of common resources, and now routine, largely unobserved processes involving massive tranches of public subsidy looted from other sectors. The capture of cultural facilities and amenities as economic assets is now mainstream und under an expanding rentier economy. The art of monopoly rent has been sent... What, how are we doing for time? About 20 minutes. About 20 minutes. Okay, I think I'll skip that section. <laughs> In that case, uh, just let me find myself a wee bit. Okay, I was going to talk a little bit about monopoly rent, but maybe I'll just kind of do a brief synopsis of that. So there's a paper by Elliot Tretter. Uh, in 2009, and I think I sent a copy of a, an article I wrote in response to it called The Tyranny of Rent for, for Variant 2010. I don't know if any copies were printed off. And it's based on the... Sorry, 
it's in the research room. And it's based on, Tretter's thesis is basically based on an article by David Harvey called The Art of Monopoly Rent. And uh, the main thesis, I suppose, would be that cities, uh, the monopoly rent is ultimately derived from two things, uh, location and scarcity. So uh, location would be that monopoly rent would be derived from, say, something like a large train station would be next to a hotel or uh, housing, um, amenities like a river, uh, parks or so on. Scarcity would be something like a, you know, a burn in the Isle, in the Isle <laughs> for instance, where you can produce the finest malt whiskey in the world, possibly. Uh, you know, uh, uh, vineyard, something like that, because the sun sits on the, the, the vineyard in a certain way at a certain time, and it produces these beautiful grapes. So there's, uh, you know, the work of art is another kind of obvious example where it can be very, very hard to, uh, you know, the value might be produced in different ways beyond just the labour that get, is involved in it. So what Tretter's main argument, I suppose, was that the city itself can be seen as a site that can be a source of monopoly rent. And what he argues is that in uh, the 1980s and 1990s especially, Glasgow increasingly began to take its uh, cultural and leisure resources and treat them as a source of uh, a source for extracting mon monopoly rent, you know, and this is like a, a target, uh, a strategy that you can see developed very, very precisely out the deindustrialization in Glasgow's kind of re requirements and a, a fiscal crisis coming from um, decisions in central government to stop uh, funding regions and local cities. So cities increasingly had to find ways to to generate revenue, and Glasgow. One of the things were historic achievements of Glasgow, um, which in the late 19th century, early 20th century, was very well known as being this kind of uh, city of municipal socialism, was that it has a lot of public assets and resources and infrastructure. And that trajectory has been really, really clear over the last 20, 30 years, where these, all these public assets, uh, commons, if you like, have been raided on a really pretty dramatic scale as a means of generating revenue for the, the local council. I mean, in some senses, you have to maybe say that it's quite difficult to generate revenues when you're completely, when your public funding is completely withdrawn. Uh, but I think my view is that the Labour Party have uh, kind of gone for this pretty zealously, you know, over the last 30, 40 years. So, Tretter maintains that the drive towards monopoly rents in Glasgow was built on the valorisation of Glasgow's unique and distinctive cultural assets as a tool to promote economic growth. He cites a report by the Museums and Galleries uh, Commission in 1986 which assessed Glasgow's cultural infrastructure as one of the largest in the UK. When Scottish local government reorganisation in 1973 made art infrastructure the exclusive domain of district councils, including all capital and revenue expenditures, expenditures related to the fine and performing arts. The Glasgow District Council were legally sanctioned to exploit Glasgow's cultural infrastructure for economic growth. In the run-up to the City of Culture year, Tretter argues, GDC routinely emphasised the comparative advantage these assets afforded the city in terms of promoting such a goal. We can see from Glasgow's culture and lever, um, We can see that the, in the shift from Glasgow's culture and le leisure services to Glasgow life, as another long-term process that seeks to derive surplus value from common public goods, subordinating culture and leisure services to business interests, particularly tourism and urban regeneration. Rebecca Gordon Nesbitt covered this transition in detail in the new Bohemia and Glasgow Life or Death for Variant 2008 and 2011. If anybody hasn't read that, they're probably worth reading. And, um, of course, such processes were not confined to culture alone. In 1975, 75% of all Glasgow's housing was social housing. In 1981, 63% of that total was public housing. 
directly funded by central government through local councils, as opposed to social housing, a term that has become increasingly elastic and now involves private housing, part by fantastical notions of affordability. After the right to buy programme and stock transfer process from public housing to Glasgow Housing Association in 2003, there is no public housing in Glasgow and less, for less than 35% of social housing, including all the bastardised variants I have just described. But returning to culture in the city, I want to now just briefly describe what has been happening in two areas of the city where the arts-led proper property strategy has been most distinct. I'll start with the Merchant City before considering the Spears Wharf Cultural Quarter. Uh, I'm going to go off script for these sections since I know them pretty closely, but I am pretty tired, so I hope it's going to be all right. Um, <laughs> so the, the Merchant City has a... I, I think one of the things that Tom was... We were talking a little bit before, and Tom was saying maybe some people are kind of new to the city. I mean, certainly a lot of people in the arts and cultural sector move around and come from different places. So it's maybe important to just give a little bit of a background to that. The Merchant City had basically, um, throughout the 50s and the 60s, the Merchant City was actually like a thriving working class area. Uh, and it had a lot of a lot of the buildings were used as warehouses and the textile industries and so on, and it had the biggest uh, fruit and vegetable market in Glasgow. Um, so there was a plan. Folk, folk know about the M8 and the M74 properly, and now you have the East End Regeneration Route. But before the East End Regeneration Route, in the early 70s, there was all these plans to finally do complete this ring road. And one of the plans, believe it or not, was to run a road right up <laughs> through what would have been the Merchant City and up through uh, Strathclyde University. And um, the plan never came to fruition, but it actually created huge amounts of planning blight in that area. And there was also problems a little bit with the fruit and vegetable market, you know, with the kind of dynamism of new automobiles, motorway structures. So there was a need to kind of look at that again. But effectively what happened, the Merchant City went into a really, really heavy decline in the 70s. And f from as early as the 1970s, the District Council was starting to put money into it and starting to put subsidies into it. And sometime in the early 80s, mid 80s, uh, it started to get rebranded as the Merchant City. And uh, based on the the historical, the tobacco lords, basically, who essentially made their money and made the wealth in Glasgow to a large extent based on the back of slavery uh, through the tobacco plantations in West, West Virginia. So this was like a hugely uh, contested notion that you could celebrate this new city, uh, this new part of the city, merchant city, and the new entrepreneurialism that was beginning to happen already then and associated directly with this historical tradition of violence, exploitation and slavery. This is precisely why the Worker City chose that name as a kind of direct, they said no, it was actually workers who built this city. It wasn't like merchants and entrepreneurs, it was the labour of people who were exploited who built the city. Mm -hmm. So you had this trajectory, the National Garden Festival uh, and the Culture Year 1990, Merchant City, and but still Huge amounts of public subsidies, a lot of Glasgow's gentrification in the 1980s first occurred in, in the Merchant City area, and massive amounts of public subsidies went in there. I read somewhere between 1988 and 1999 rents doubled, like precisely doubled in that area. So it's, there's a long trajectory of boosterism behind what's going on, going on now in that area. And I mean, I, more specifically for this discussion, um, Trongate 103 was established, when was it, 2008, 9, somewhere around that. Yeah, so, and the, the notion there was nominally that there was a lot of arts organisations spread across the Merchant City and uh, the, the Victorian architecture around there and was to rationalise that. So to pull these arts organisations into one building which uh, I was saying to somebody before, it seems to me to look a bit like an empty shopping mall most of the time, and create this arts hub 
that would then be a kind of creative cluster that would generate footfall in the area and would like get a lot of people coming to that area. But at the simultaneously, we'd open up those spaces for different types of developments, for office development, for micro enterprises. And I was just reading something lately that a friend of mine, Lee, Variant, uh, Lee French, sent on from Variant and said that you're beginning to see more micro enterprises in those buildings. And, uh, uh, you know, like the uh, Bell, is it Bell Street, the cleaning depot is now being transformed into, into housing. Uh, so there, there has been some changes, but I think something I would like to argue is that gentrification isn't like a fait accompli in Glasgow. It's not London where massive amounts of global capital are being dumped into the city. And when an area starts to gentrify, it goes like that and gets turned over. <laughs> In Glasgow, it's much more difficult. There's a lot of poverty in Glasgow. I mean, you can see that. Um, I've done a lot of research on the Commonwealth Games and the Clyde Gateway. I mean, a lot of areas are still unlet. You know, huge amounts of public subsidy have gone into transforming land, remediating land, and preparing it, and, and giving capital every opportunity to come in there and make profit, and still it doesn't come. So... So this is one thing I think is really important. And again, looking at the Merchant City area, there's still really a lot of two-let signs about, you take a walk around the Merchant City on a Tuesday or a Wednesday morning about half past 11, there's hardly anybody around. You know, so it's, so, so these things have a, they have a certain momentum, uh, but which is instrumentalized, which is given to them, but they don't always culminate in the results that, say, the district council would want. So that's like a kind of potential opening or space for people to see that isn't foreclosed, it's not overdetermined completely, there's still possibilities for manoeuvre there. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk about very briefly is, uh, this is a bit of a hobby horse of mine, because I don't think anybody else is really writing about this at all. The Spears Locks uh, Cultural Quarter, which is basically at the terminus of the Forth and Clyde Canal. And probably a lot of people know about that, I suppose. Most people, it is an art setting, right? So the glue factory, uh, there's various the Scottish operas, fair, there's a few other like arts National institutions, theater. national theatre. There's, there's several kind of um, establishments based there. Now, what I would say is there's been a kind of narrative about that, that it's like people have just kind of, it's a sort of classic bohemian-like narrative of folk just taking opportunities to find these spaces and capitalise on them and turn them into this, uh, you know, kind of vibrant kind of arts, cultural quarter. But it's pretty clear that the council literally dragged people into that area, OK, and gave them funding and said, OK, you can come here, here's some peppercorn rents, get to work, you know. And, and what's interesting to me about that space is that um, I did a public walk with Transmission Gallery uh, with a group called the Strickland Distribution, was it 2011, 2012, is it's a really, really vast area of urban decline, of uh, brownfield land, and in other words, it's a huge development opportunity. But the problem for that, for the, in terms of the city council, has always been that area is heavily stigmatised. The north of Glasgow is one of the poorest areas. It's cut off by the M8. Um, there's problems of toxic toxicity, contamination. So for me, very, very clearly what's happened is the city council has said, OK, let's get some catalyst initiatives here. Let's start to get people using this space. Let's start to publicise it in a certain way, in this kind of progressive way, arts, creativity, sustainability. And, you know, let's see what we can do with that. Once we start getting some football there, we might get a little bit of momentum with this catalyst uh, initiatives, and then maybe we can really start to go to work. And in a way, you can kind of see, again, I would say that that's progress is extremely slow. Um, there, but you, you know, you're beginning to see some things like the National Theatre of Scotland moving up there is probably like quite a big deal. Uh, you know, it's, I, I don't know, some people might know a little bit more about how heavily the whiskey bond is used, but it seems reasonably well used. Uh, so, and probably some of your tenants. Um, but, so, so there's, 
there's so this is kind of interesting, but on, on the other hand, I think what needs to be really, really clearly stated is there's been absolutely brutal processes of demolition and clearance fair. So Hamilton Hill, for instance, is just run down to the ground and those buildings have been demolished. Hamilton Hill was one of the earlier uh, council housing estates in, in Glasgow, which is just up from the Whiskey Bond. And, and Site Hill is one of the kind of greatest disgraces that has ever uh, befallen Glasgow, actually, in terms of what's gone on there. So when, when Site Hill was built initially, it was like 10 uh, large <coughs> Zealander high-rise housing blocks and um, 2,500 homes. So you're probably talking about 10,000 people living there. And uh, basically, almost as soon as it was built, it was, it was being run down. And um, so it's been through this kind of gradual demolition uh, progress for some time now, and now all the blocks are, are finally down. And, and I need to be clear that a lot of the tenants really like staying there, because it's one of those places you see, but when you're actually up there, it's an amazing sight, because you're, you're right above the city, you can see the whole city, uh, you're very, very close to the city, in many ways, and a lot of people really wanted to stay there. So each time they would say, we're going to, we'll, we'll knock down five blocks. And they said, no, we don't want you to do that. Okay, we'll knock down three, but you can have two. And it just went on like this until finally they knocked down all the blocks. Um, so that area is now opened up on a, on a very, very large scale. Uh, and there's really, we're talking like hundreds and hundreds of acres of land up there. And you're beginning to see certain things like this adventure, uh, there's some kind of adventure parks, uh, uh, space they want to open up at Dundas Hill. But if you read behind the lines and if you look at the planning and policy documents, it's pretty clear what they want to do. They want to start building housing there, they want to start building offices. So basically, I just think it's really important that people are aware that that is going on there. It doesn't mean that I don't think people, I, I think people shouldn't go to Spears Locks or even do work there, but I think people really need to think very, very closely about how that is interrelated to this wider context, because really it's very, very clearly a kind of class clearance project. And there's a lot of chat about community and about community consultation, and I've done a little bit of work on this, but I've seen, you know, how that process has worked. So essentially what happens is uh, the, uh, a phalanx of kind of artists and arts professionals have been brought into that area and then been consulted. And that community, which has been imported, then becomes the community that represents that whole area. So, you know, a lot of really kind of dodgy things, but hidden with very kind of sophisticated language often and, and um, you know, seemingly quite progressive. Um, you know, I know I actually don't want to keep going up. <laughs> it makes me pretty angry what's going on there, to be honest. But um, how are we for time? Because maybe... About 20 minutes of the slot left. So I don't know if you want to show the film or... Do you want yeah, to... I think we could do that. I mean, I, I had... I think this is the critique side of the discussion. And in a way, I did want to maybe open up some ways of thinking about this more critically and how there might be some more productive engagement. Uh, but maybe we could just have that in question. So I have a, I have a, a 10 minute, 11 minute film I made and it was made um, in West Bromwich. I don't know if anybody knows about a building called The Public in West Bromwich. So it's a kind of large magenta blob that's been put into the heart of West Bromwich. Uh, and, and again, it operates very much in this way that it might provide this catalyst to change an area that's gone into a lot of uh, industrial economic delight, uh, decline, a lot of brownfield sites. Um, uh, but it has some kind of similarities, I think, with certain stages of, of Glasgow. So I think it's maybe useful. And it's just a short 10 minute thing. I was invited down to do a talk at this uh, symposium, which is much like this symposium. And at the end of it, uh, some of us were asked if we wanted to do any work, like a specific, because mainly it was talks. And I said I would do a short film. Um, and what else to say about it? It's kind of blunt. I don't really, <laughs> like, as, a, as an art object, I wouldn't really like show it out of this kind of context. 
because it was made specifically to maybe challenge um, in this context of this symposium some of the views I was hearing from certain arts pr practitioners. So it was designed to be pretty kind of provocative and, and in that sense it's maybe a bit like, um, it's a bit telly rather than showy. <laughs> okay, so in an arts context that's not very good, but uh, in, a, in this kind of context I think it's okay to, to show it. So. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, one thing I'd recommend to anyone who wants to read about planning in supermarkets in Britain is Joanna Blythman, the food writer's book, Shop, The Shop and Power of Supermarkets in Britain, which makes those comparisons between French, German and other European models of how urban space was negotiated. I read it, it's probably over 10 years old, but I found it a really, I read it for fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite an accessible book, but it kind of explores some of those really specific policies about the relationship of community development, council planning, allocations mm -hmm. of space in private and public, and then also supermarket roles in that, which has been you know overly advantaged in Britain specifically. Yeah. And um, the footnote I wanted to make was um, related to that example of. Um, Trongate 103 and it makes me think of something which I think quite often in relation to kind of sub-narrative to, to the way we talk about artists accessing empty space that was publicly owned and then the development of um, this kind of more planned and uh, controlled mm -hmm. structures which have housed activity which had its history in more autonomous forms of organising. Um, and that's to do with the relationships within local authorities themselves and actually the employment of working class people within mm -hmm. the public sector and the kind of civic impetus of people who would have worked in the public sector historically. You know, in the place, you've written a lot about community, you know, community and art. So in the space of community art, there's also a friction between people who were making um, their work and employment through either, in, you know, publicly supported institutions or the institutions of local government themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I say this as someone with 10 years of local authority experience working in arts development, but in Glasgow as a specific model, I also, at the time of those developments, was really mindful of the fact that there were people who were, who were never credited in any way, who were never written about, and who were mm -hmm. never visible within these narratives, who were proactively engaged with the artistic communities and would act as an internal mediator within their own institution to mm -hmm. get quick and easy access to the estates teams or you know other mm -hmm. other bodies. And at the point when specifically in Glasgow, which is what Rebecca Gordon is but writes about in the piece you mentioned, when 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 Glasgow then you know takes its real estate and passes it into a private sector organisation to operate, that chain of communication is completely eradicated, mm -hmm. and people working in the in the arts parts of public, um, public sector organisations going to lose that direct contact. Because I do think a lot of what was happening in what's often talked about as Glasgow's, you know, kind of romantic years of setting up a transmission yeah, yeah, and so yeah. on, was accommodated and supported and facilitated mm -hmm. by people who were employed by the city. Yeah. But they were employed by the city under contracts which gave them stability, not precarity. They were employed in the city where they had certain amounts of autonomy about their work. They weren't having to own risk independently. So I just, it's a footnote to be mindful of the complexities yeah. of those relationships because I do think if we talk about artists having to, you know, artists, I'll use that as a short, yeah. <laughs> as kind of having the, the innovation and the kind of um, gumption to, to, to take on empty space, that kind of denotes the fact that that space was owned publicly and there were people in the public sector mm -hmm. who were deliberately facilitating and supporting and making it easier for artists yeah. to access that space. Not because for them they had a regeneration agenda in mind, but for them there was a civic responsibility as a public sector employee to actually embrace the the work of people who were working from, you know, kind of in grassroots context, which were partly activists, were partly critical, mm -hmm. whatever else. So, it's a footnote, just um, maybe it's a footnote for another generation. <laughs> yeah. You know, having lived through this yeah. period of the disenfranchisement of public and private into the, the big neoliberal mm -hmm. soup of no one really knows who owns anything and what can be done, you know. 
that, that there is a kind of hidden history about that kind of that, that kind of um, mm -hmm. stakeholder within the, the, how these things. And the reason I wanted to bring it up is in relation to Trongate 103 and the fact that <clears throat> by inhabiting council buildings which couldn't otherwise be. Um, so you, you're talking about a whole number of organisations across the Merchant City, like Projectability and GMAC, as well as Transmission and Street Level, who's, who have effectively stayed where they were at the time. Mm -hmm. But other organisations coming in had, you know, they, were, they, they had an interest and a need for far more accessible buildings. You know, tra walking up five flights of stairs to GMAC was not a particularly accessible public, yeah, public organisation. You know, it was hidden within the architecture of the city itself, and it didn't have. Um, a way of um, you know kind of accommodating people of all kinds to access those facilities. So I just mm -hmm. I, I think it's I think it's I know that you weren't saying it was as simple <laughs> as no, it no, is, no. and I know that you're yeah. bound by that. But I guess I just always want to make that point in terms of the understanding of the complexity of what's changed. A lot has changed beyond just the yeah, yeah the, the the planning and the, and the, and the kind of. But it, I, I, I do, I understand what you're saying, but I do think it is also important to say that at the same time Glasgow had very, very specific urban policies. Yeah. For instance, the Italian Institute, you know, proceeded or was at the same time as these developments. Mm -hmm. So I would be wary of a kind of, um, of a narrative as well that talks about a certain kind of civic, uh, you know, state, uh -huh. uh, civic-minded kind of uh -huh. notion that was always, uh, like, detached from these other I don't developments. Say it's detached, I think it's parallel or something. It's, it's parallel, you know, but I, I think in a way it's an, it's an interesting point because in a way something I've always fought with Glasgow, for like people who are not from Glasgow, Glasgow is notoriously always had a very, very strong Labour Council and has perhaps always had some obligation to respond to this kind of narrative of Glasgow's mm -hmm. left exceptional, exceptionalism. But I think in the, in the 90s, so what that meant is that the networks and capillary networks across Glasgow were really fundamentally integrated. And I think when you started to shift into a more neoliberal landscape, that meant that could almost become quite viral, mm -hmm. in a sense, because there's nothing kind of blocking those capillaries acting then in a different way, in a more venal way. Mm -hmm. But as you say, when you do that, when you open up those spaces to different private, you lose control over a lot of those developments. So the, the River Clyde would be a really good example. You know, there's something called a master plan for the yeah. River Clyde. I mean, it's just the most ridiculous notion in the world because all along the River Clyde is calved off into like private, you know, uh, spaces who are all seeking to maximise as much profit as they can. So there's no planning there. I mean, I think you can probably say that about planning per se almost nowadays. It's, you know, in a sense that, like, yeah, you can't, you can't really have a master plan. And it's not, it's not to do with like planners or architects becoming more sophisticated and moving away from this kind of totalitarian notion of like master plan and it's basically it's impossible to do now because you just don't own the land <laughs> you know you can't you can't shape it point, though, is, uh, you know, master plans are created ad nauseum with the austin smith lord master plan for the city center which looks fantastic another iteration of what the city center could look like but ultimately Tesco trumps them all because they come in and say we're going to create a thousand jobs and you know fantastic ideas to create a, a community park or something just get chucked yeah. straight away, which is what you're saying about development waterfront, waterfront carved up yeah. into a series of disconnected capitals, fiefdoms, which are just there for profit. And you probably wouldn't even end up with a way you could actually walk along the waterfront with actually with, with Yeah, that's right, you can't land. actually do it, yeah. Um, and things, you know, yeah. which is crazy. Yeah. And, um, I mean, that permeates, I think, the whole sort of British approach to planning is short-termism. It all, it all seems to rotate around four year political cycles. And if nothing's achieved at the end of that, we're not interested. Yeah, I would, I would probably agree. I mean, sorry? Yeah, I just, um, a couple of things about the city development plan. 
is funded by City Deal, but essentially DRS do want to, in a way, reevaluate how planning is perceived within the city. Mm -hmm. And you take the Waterford, for example, they are actively saying to those landowners like Peel, what's your responsibility? And what's your commitment to the city? You can't just have a gap site that sits for like 10, 15 years until you basically are offered you know, a high enough mm -hmm. uh, bid for that to be acceptable. And part of the problem is you know, the, the ownership. It's people that are disconnected from the city. So there is movement to actually actively encourage people to behave more responsibly. And some of this stuff isn't about money. It's about a commitment to the city. It's about actually letting something else happen on the land in between um, some form of development. But that was just a side issue. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was um, people describe the movement of people within the residents from the city centre of Glasgow to the project itself around the outskirts of the city mm -hmm. akin to the trauma experienced by Aboriginal people in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think the effect we've talked about in a way, the kind of almost quite easy, easier to talk about in terms of how buildings and land has been kind of divided and privatised. Mm -hmm. What about how, what about the, um, the way in which people have been driven out of the city during that time and rehoused? Yeah, well, I think that there's a lot of, I mean, that's kind of a huge question, but there's a lot of very, very interesting points. Maybe some people are aware now there's um, uh, been kind of a recent spate of papers and research by um, a group of people, Jerry McCartney, Chick Collins, people like that, and they've talked about the Glasgow effect. So for a long time, I've always been very pissed off with this uh, mysterious notion of the Glasgow effect, which is basically that Glasgow has um, a mortality in excess of other comparable cities. So it, it seemed that the excess mortality rate was above what you could expect for, from other old industrial cities. So, so there's been like a, a fantastic kind of cottage industry of like theories in a way about this, you know, this Glasgow effect. And um, the, and I, I completely agree with uh, what Chick Holland, Jerry McCartney and these other people are saying. I can't remember all the names of these scholars. Because essentially what, what they're saying is that this is completely related to the large-scale urban rede redevelopment projects that occurred. There's the Bruce Plan and the Abercrombie Plan in the 1940s. And both of them... Both of them actually, the, the Bruce plan was more a Glasgow City Council one and the Abercrombie plan was more a Scottish office. So the Bruce plan wanted to retain the population of Glasgow in the city centre and keep it compact. Um, acknowledging that there was lots of problems with tenements and so on, deindustrialisation. And the Abercrombie plan was the new towns, basically. Um, and... <laughs> But both of them ended up with losing a popula like projected population loss of 500,000 people you know, to deal with these kind of slum conditions. And um, what they argue, and I think they argue rightly, in a way it was really the Abercrombie plan that won out with a partial compromise with the Bruce plan. So you could see the peripheral estates of like Pollock, um, uh, Easter House, Drum Chapel, Castle Mount, is being part of the kind of Bruce plan, but a little bit of a kind of botched, <laughs> middling part of it. Um, but what, what they say is that because the Abercrombie plan won out um, and the new towns were built and you had this mass exodus, population exodus, that was generally like uh, working age people who left. So it was basically healthy people. People could go and work in the new tech industries that were supposed to be the future and unfortunately weren't. So what that left behind, and I'll give you an example, is uh, Bridgeton and Dilmarnock. And I think maybe about 1956, there was uh, 140,000 people in Bridgeton and Dilmarnock. You know, there'd been a lot of big industries there, really tightly knit uh, tenement communities. 
and by 1986 there was 40,000 people there. Um, and they basically raised a lot of the tenements and by then the comprehensive develop development area projects we did in places like the Garbles, Townhead, Anderston were already deemed to be a complete failure. So effectively they demolished all the buildings and then didn't replace them with anything. So completely broke that fabric of the whole of the East End. And the people that were left over were predominantly older people, many people who'd been working in industry all their lives, so had, you know, there was like White's Chemical Works there, you know, all kind of like industry-related ailments. So you had, you know, and so then you have a situation where the World Health Organization um, could say in 2003 that the average life expectancy in Catalan is 54, right? So that's very, very extreme. But in places like a lot of places in the East End, it would be early 60s average life expectancy, whereas Lindsay would be something like 84, right? So, yeah, so this is like a, so this is a physical, mental, psychosocial yeah. disaster. But then, yeah. what is kind of in circles, numerous architectural, public rights cultural agencies are coming into places like Easter House, asking in consultations what would create a thriving community. And one of the problems is, is that underlying um, that rupture has never been at all resolved. So one of the kind of difficulties is that people see uh, that kind of form of engagement as successful if people who are isolated are coming together. Mm -hmm. But that's a very kind of lowest common denominator kind of what's called kind of easy win yeah. mentality. But the kind of ideological and physical rupture that's taking place is, isn't really resolved. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think you have to acknowledge it's really, really difficult. But, you know, m most people in those communities... <laughs> no, I mean in terms of... <laughs> it's a, a summary, but, but I think a lot of people, you know, having worked in housing campaigns and stuff over the years, just feel like consulted to death, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all the kind of professional apparatus that comes in. And, you know, and of course within that, of course there's people who are really good and really engaged in what they're doing, but as a general process, it, 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 it's people who don't generally have an understanding of what people have been through in that area who are offering professional solutions for how to resolve that. And they're usually extremely low budget, very, very partial, and usually what's presented is a decision that's already made in classic situationist slogan terms. You know, it's so. So, people's engagement with that is, is of course, going to be limited. You know. Um, right. Uh, yeah, that should be. There because we're kind of at the service. So, uh, thank you very much, Neil. Yeah.